Scott Spears, and today we're joined by Damon Zex. Damon has starred in many video productions, as well as guested on The Jerry Springer Show and The Sally Jesse Raphael Show. He is also starring in a new movie, Checkmate. Today we are joined by the very unique, and you'll see that when you see him, Damon Zex. Damon, thank you so much for being here today. It's a pleasure being here. Tell me what your childhood was like. I, I think that my childhood, I started actually creating art at the age of two. My mother was an artist, so I started sculpting. I became like a little Mozart prodigy by the age of four. At five, I learned to play chess, <laughs> so, and I later went on to win the state championship at that. Thus, the checkmate thing, the, the, the chess and SM thing, the mixing of, of things. Uh, in ways, I had a very normal childhood. In other ways, it was extraordinary because I had a, an artist, a mother who's an artist, so and a teacher. So by, before I even went to elementary school, I was rather educated. It's very interesting. What was high school like for you? Kind of mundane. <laughs> you know, I, I, the most interesting thing I did was change high schools my senior year, and I ended up at Columbus Alternative High School, which was a place of complete weirdos. And I think that's when I started really wearing makeup and uh, putting on black capes and going to Rocky Horror Picture Show uh, back then. But, um, you know, in, I, I don't know. I, I got all A's. I didn't study. I partied. I went to tons of parties. I was pretty active social and uh, and then I re I think I realized that once once I went to change schools once I got into a new group I thought well I can just take this over and I was also in theater I played Scrooge you know <laughs> bah humbug yes <laughs> I played an old man good good dialect yes there. it is yes, Abs it is. absolutely now okay people who see you now Obviously, right. and I and I and I had you put on this makeup. I asked you to do this because in all the videos I see, you right. usually have this on. Right. What is this? What What are you doing here? It's actually the ancient uh, Persian god Athram Mabel. No, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I was told that actually by uh, some people who knew ancient uh, Persian gods, and they said that your makeup looks exactly like this ancient deity. I have always loved silent movies, surreal films, Chaplin, W.C. Fields, Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd. So that's a giant chunk of my background and Peter Sellers and all these great comics. And I have always loved uh, German expressionism and extreme exaggeration theatrically. If I would have asked you to come here today, would it be normal, as a guest on a talk show, to wear the makeup? Typically, it, it depends. I could put this on. I, I wear normal eyeliner all the time. I love eyeliner. Always I, wear eyeliner. Not always. No, but not for, while I'm for at appearance, the gym. Well, appearances. Appearances. Yeah, yeah. Why? I, I just like it. You know, I like the, I like the, the look. It, it's a pure aesthetic vanity thing. I mean, point blank. I love putting eyeliner on. I love working with black line. I, I do pen and inks, too. So, you know, I'm an artist, and I have a master's in fine art. So, for some reason, I have always loved real extreme color graphic appearance of things. I love it theatrically, and I also love it in drawing. So, I could I dip a pen in <laughs> to India ink, or I can take a brush and apply it on my face. Either way, I love the act of doing that. If you don't have this on, and you don't have the eyeliner on, are you a different person? No. Same person. I get the same personality. Yeah, I think so. You think so? <laughs> I think so. You don't well, know. Well, we so don't know. I mean, we don't know. I'm actually a group of people, and sometimes we meet at and have board meetings and decide which one comes out the most. So many people have said I'm a great group of, uh, of guys. So, you know. Do you control the group, though? Is it, it I mean, Kind let's of a collective. Well, let's be honest here. Are we are we talking about somebody who plays a lot of characters, an actor who plays a lot of characters? Or are we talking borderline schizophrenic? No, no. No, so you control I, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm okay. a control freak, actually. 
Okay, well that's that's <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll be honest. I mean, I I you know I work out every day. I'm very focused. I'm very regimented. And what most people don't realize is the making of these TV shows, even the wildest ones I've ever done, the amount of rigor behind the scenes. I'm sure you understand when you're dealing with people, camera people, lighting people, everything else. I I have a lot of experience. I've lit operas. I've done things like that. So when I came into public access and started making my show, I came there. I, you know, I, I'm tyrannical. I was tyrannical almost. I said, okay, we got to do this again. We got to do this again. We got to do this again. I, I'll take many, many, many takes, hundreds of hours behind the scenes of post-production work. I would do the, my own editing, and uh, and I'm that way with any type of art. So. And that those, by the way, I want to mention a lot of those programs are available on the internet. But if you're a young child, you know, maybe not for you. Parents, be cautious before you look at some of those. Not all of them but some of them, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But uh, I want to know who Damon Zex is, because that is not your real name. Right. Who's Damon Zex? Character. No. Well, when define you say this who, character. When you say who, define you, this character. When you say who, what do you mean? I mean, well, because not, you're not going to get... Is he you? As it's the a person. surreal fusion. It's like, I, it's like performance art. It's when you do a performance art piece, you are the conceptual artist. I view myself as a multimedia slash conceptual artist. So I choose to enter and play with different media as that individual using whatever kind of theatrical presentation is at my disposal or whatever media I choose to enter into. I do it from a conceptual standpoint first. So I guess you could say Damon Zex is a thinker. Damon Zex is a philosopher. Uh, as I said, multimedia artist. And um, all around, just a rather normal guy. <laughs> Don't I normal? Is this a show? Are you? Are we not? A show? Shakespeare said, "Is life not but a Yeah, but is this a show? If I were sitting here right now with you, without the makeup, without the eyeliner, I, I would probably describe myself similarly. Similar. Yeah. But there is a difference. I don't know. Yeah, it's you, hard the to say. It's a, quantum, it's a quantum effect. The line it's is blurred. Yeah, it's a borderline because there's a quantum effect. We don't know. Now, in another possible universe, perhaps you would say, don't come here with the makeup on, don't do this, and then you would see, then you would have to analyze the difference, and then you'd have to see, is there really a difference in character? I don't think so. Well, I think because I started as a thinker. My, my degree, my bachelor's is in philosophy. So I, I came into this as a thinker, and a lot of people in the arts don't think. They just do what they like, but I, can't, I come into things with a lot of conceptualization before I take action. So there's a lot of thought before what I do. Well, here's why I ask that question, because in all the shows I've seen you do in the movies mm -hmm. and the clips, mm -hmm. you either have this makeup on or you are calling yourself Damon Zex. Right. Now, in Life at the Gym, you don't have the makeup on. But and I'm Damon still Damon Zex. But it's not your driver's license. Well. So is there a difference? Not really. Okay. So this Not is really. you. It, it's, it's pretty much the same because, you know, I actually had a great clip of me at the gym that was, that was on uh, YouTube. I believe it was yanked, flagged, and taken off. Now, why? Uh, because of the substance that was comedically done at the end of that. I tell you what, we're going to talk about substance <laughs> and, and, and things censorship yeah. later in this interview. But uh, where d we, fin we found out where this character came from. How did you get on public access television? Tell us that story. I first, you know, the very beginning, it was the very, Take me very, back to the beginning. Very <laughs> Way back. Way back. Okay. I had a band, okay, and we came to the public access station back in 1985. So we got to the station. There wasn't enough time for us to put our band out to the studio. <laughs> equipment, wires, or this, forget it. Why don't we just do a talk show now? You interview me. I'll play the head of this cult, the uh, head of a witch's cult that meets at McDonald's or whatever. Uh, you you uh, be the psychologist. And we created a show called Smoke Ring. Back then, you could smoke in the studio. <laughs> so way back. Yeah, way. So, so we were blowing all these smoke rings. So my very first time of public access was on a show called Smoke Ring. The next time I entered public access, I came in with my video Glitznik, which was a three-minute, I would say quasi-music video, 
but it's a little too experimental. It doesn't quite fit into any genre. So I entered that, and then I worked with a, a collaborator on a series of music videos. So I entered it from two perspectives, a comedic perspective and a perspective of uh, experimentation with special effects, art, uh, visuals, etc. And that's all through my show, so that I got into making, converting sound into light waves, playing with light waves, working with hypnotic effects, doing all kinds of creations like that, and at the same time, coming up with all these different characters, and so there's just a, a fusion of these different aspects. Why did the show go off? Well, the public access was shut down. Which, it, which is going to bring us to a very, I think, uh, important part of this interview. Uh, I didn't realize this until you had pointed this out to me the other day. In 1999, you were an expert art witness in a U.S. federal court uh, case Correct. concerning the First Amendment. Correct. Tell us what that case was, why was it concerning the First Amendment, and why were you a, a witness? I was a witness because, I was picked as a witness because of my master's in fine arts. So I was an art witness. The case was, uh, I believe, how uh, was Lucan versus CCCA. It was over another character on public access who w had his show yanked, uh, and it on the cr on the grounds that it was obscene. They were making an obscenity claim in court, and clearly, by any stretch of the imagination, the show was not obscene. It was on the edge, but it wasn't obscene. But obscenity is very tightly defined. Well, what what standards. did what happened on the show? The thing that they yanked, the, the thing they pulled was a guy sitting in front of two, a clip from a, a, uh, an advertisement, I think, for a Playboy channel or something, where he's like, I'm not getting any, something like that. But you didn't see any kind of sexuality. You didn't see, it was so light compared to, let's say, Howard Stern bringing in a, a nude body onto his show. There's no comparison. So the show was yanked. He took them to court. And it was, it was a jury trial, which really was a mistake, in my opinion. It was a federal court case. And there are very tight rules and regulations regarding your freedom of speech and what is considered obscene. They're very, very, very narrow. So there was an issue of community standards where the station, as a nonprofit organization, wanted to assert its rights that it had that it could determine what the community standards were locally. He was coming in from the perspective that there is a federal standard and that it is not right for the local government to in any way, shape, or form or any local organization interfere with the provisos of public access, which were set up as federal statutes. So I was put on the stand. <laughs> it was very funny because the attorney at the time I'd actually had in an art law class at Ohio State University several years earlier. And he was interviewing, he was trying to discredit me, and, and he failed. But by this time, the case was already lost because we had a jury. Uh, it was not a jury of one's peers, for one. I, I don't think there was a person on the, the jury under 60, you know, to begin with. So lots of people were kicked off the jury. And you had a problem where if he had won the case, then certain key government officials would have been put on the stand for having given money and supported the public access the station to, and what happened was they originally took him to court, then he countersued. And, they, and, act, and the local government is not supposed to interfere with something that was set up as a fed, with federal guidelines. But does it, who pulled the program? The, the public access channel. Okay. If you are the head of that channel, you can, any channel, network, cable, whatever. If the show is not getting whatever it is, good ratings, the right advertisers, the so right you demographic. realize there are no advertisers. On I understand that. But, but they use a lot of reasons to pull shows. So if you are the owner, in essence, or you are the board that governs the station, shouldn't you have a right for whatever reason to pull somebody off? Just no, as because then you set up a precedent where you individually determine, they, you are, when you enter public access, you are guaranteed your freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is guaranteed by the First Amendment. The, the, unless you are doing something like doing something to particularly generate hate in the audience or you're actually proposing 
if I made a show and I said, hey, I want you people to go out and kill someone or, or, or do something and it was not a comedy and you were not playing a role or you were actually trying to promote some kind of hate crime or you were doing something that was truly devastating where, where you were in a situation. Cincinnati Access, incidentally, has had issues like that with the KKK and different things in the past where they've had those type of issues and still, even with those groups, they often are allowed to go on the air because they are entitled to their First Amendment right. As a guest, I think. But if you're doing a show... No, not as a guest, as a show. Well, hold on, though. Because if you're doing a show, if you're doing a show, and somebody just doesn't like the content... I, mean, I remember years ago there was a story that Bill Paley, the president of CBS, just loved gun smoke. And he didn't want gun smoke to be canceled. So he allowed Gilligan's Island to be canceled, which had better ratings, better sponsors, right. so on and so forth, just because he didn't want gun smoke to be canceled. Isn't that – you can't be arrested no, for no, freedom of speech, but you can't, you can't be arrested for freedom of speech. But when you are working for somebody, if you go into any job, television, otherwise – uh, and you say something profane at work, it's the, isn't it the boss's prerogative to let you go? But they're not a boss. You don't work for them. You have a contract with public access to use their facility, and they are not supposed to interfere. They are supposed to follow these guidelines. They are set up under the proviso of, of the federal statutes, and they're supposed to follow those statutes. So, so you're not, it's not a boss. It's not a person that's supposed to say you're not allowed – it's just like in England with the BBC. They don't use ratings to determine shows. They have categories when because it's set up by the government. It's not a capitalist thing. Public access isn't based in any kind of capitalist venture. It was based that you are entitled to your half hour or show or ability to get on a soapbox in, in any way, shape, or form and speak to the public about what you believe in. It's not based on ratings. It's not based on what the director at that facility thinks, et cetera. It's based on your right as an individual to use. When, when, when the cable companies laid their lines in Columbus, Ohio, for example, they, they agreed to have, back then, it was mandatory. Initially, public access was actually mandatory with cable things. So people were supposed to go on public access. I mean, allowed to go on, and, and no one could kick you off for any show unless you were advocating sex with minors or or showing something really 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 off the wall but those things again are in federal statutes they're, they're specific and i don't have them memorized but they're specific federal statutes that allow that determine what is considered obscene i guess my question then would be when this show went on by this person that they found offensive it did go on right it was yanked it was pulled but it was but his episode did air Yes, the episode aired, and what happened was they pulled it, and they used a very weird mix. They said, well, he is superimposing himself in front of footage that he didn't create, that he took from something else, so it's a copyright infringement, and copyright infringement is irrelevant in public access, just like if you took any song and you made it your own video to Nirvana or some band from the 90s and sent it to MTV. They have the rights to all that, so you don't have to worry. And I know this factually, that they, they, they have a blanketed right. So public access, anyway, they tried to say, well, this is obscene, and it's not really art, and it has no artistic value, but realize it wasn't supposed to. But even so, the man's character was kind of W.C. Fields-esque, he was playing off of the notion of superimposing himself in front of funny backdrops. He was doing something that had been done, like in W.C. Fields' uh, Never Give a Sucker an Even Break, when he's falling through the sky. He, so he didn't just – he made something with some sort of artistic vision, and they were just trying to say, this is not art. Interestingly enough, my show was considered art. They never took my show off the air. My show was never banned. But, did, but didn't he get his 30 minutes to get on his soapbox and do his thing? I mean, I think that's uh, – anybody who – One could say that he was talentless, okay? One could say, well, maybe, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> haven't seen the show. But I think the problem becomes if everybody, you know, on the planet would have gone to a station like this and said, give me a half hour, give me an hour, there could be a lot of 
terrible, terrible things on. But, but there's still a lot of terrible, yes, terrible things exactly. on. Exactly. But, but, but we don't have to let it continue to go. It's not an unlimited time, <laughs> is it, to go on well, forever? Well, realize, in real truth, you're speaking hypothetically, like millions of people are going to barrage the space. There's a limited amount of time for people. You have to schedule time there. You have to volunteer on other people's shows to acquire the hours to use the facility at the time. You, you didn't just walk in the door. You had to take a class. You had to go through, uh, you had to be certified. So there were, uh, there was an entire, and the man that they sued had won an actual award from the station with a racing show several years earlier. So he, he didn't, wasn't just some stranger that walked off the street. And again, you really had a small group of characters in general who were using that facility, maybe 70, 80, I don't know, but a, a, a a small group of people because you have to be devoted you have to love tv and not everyone's just going to walk off the street and yeah there's always the person that does makes one show and says okay i made my show i'm out of there but the people that were obsessive and and love television were, were a small group of people what well, I, I tell you what we, we are going to take a break here we're going to come back with more damon zex damon was on jerry springer sally jesse Raphael. we're going to talk about the movie checkmate all when we come back after this. Are you looking for affordable office space in Marion? The professional building located at 685 Delaware Avenue is the place for you. For more information, call 740-383-6803. Office space is now available. Again, telephone number 740-383-6803. Zero three. Scott Spears back with you on Scott Spears now, joined by artist Damon Zex, and get a load of him right now. Flip over there, Damon. How are you? I am fantastic today. I feel great. Now you, you brought why? Why is that? Because we're not having a heat wave. We, <laughs> the heat wave has subsided for yes, today. For, you're lucky. That's, yeah. a, that's the number one reason that I resisted this. Is I've got to put it on makeup. I've got to do this stuff. It's 100 degrees outside, 90% humidity. I don't like this kind of weather. Well, we're glad you're here. Okay. Now, you brought some more. What, th tell us about your props and put them on. Show us some. Okay. I love these glasses. Okay. Why wouldn't I? They're great. You try finding them out on the street somewhere. These are my... Uh, I wear as my geek character. My geek character on TV, <laughs> where I've played this role many times. I've run for president as the geek. I've been a minister as the geek. And I can't see diddle squat through these glasses. <laughs> it's a good look, though. And, of course, these are the checkmate glasses. <laughs> Don't laugh. Serious thing, winning a game of chess. It's not some little child's play. You're not playing checkers. Chess. When you're playing chess, these will intimidate the opponent and almost guarantee that you win the game. <laughs> Tell me about checkmate. Checkmate is a combination of chess and bondage, but it's there's several other components to it. There is the issue in it. I am sitting there being hypnotized by a TV set telling me where I'm playing my own character, telling me the television is watching me, and, I'm, and it, it's making a statement about mind control. And then all of a sudden, I'm in this weird, slow-moving uh, piece with a woman that turns into this strange bondage scene where she, we're playing chess at first, and then it moves into this sexual thing because I'm combining the notion of the relationship, the dynamic of man and woman, the power plays that occur in a relationship with chess, because there's a lot of strategizing that occurs when you're in a relationship, and I know that all too well. <laughs> well it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, uh, film out there. want to talk about your two uh, appearances on national television. Uh, let's start with uh, Jerry Springer. I saw this one. What was that all about? Well... I, at the time, I asked the person on the show with me to marry me on Springer. And Howard Lucan, the other person who was on the show, the same person who was in the federal court case, I'll mention his name, Angster the Clown, was against it. So 
I, it was very strange how this all came about. I One night I drove to Cleveland. I went to a diner on East Detroit Street called The Big Egg. And these people said, oh, yeah, we were on Springer. Here's the number. So I called Springer about my show. I never heard another thing about it. Uh, a year went by. Nothing. All of a sudden, right when 2020 was attacking Springer for obsessive violence, excessive violence, I get a call Saturday night from the Jerry Springer people after leaving Larry's bar, 2.30 in the morning. They're like, we need a show that's a little toned down, that's a little more comedic, that's not quite as extreme. Can, and we heard your thing, and I, I explained how I, the woman on my show, how I met her, and how she had been married, and how her husband chased her back, and how since from that point on, we had been on TV. So they were like, they went against this. I said, yes. So they said, can you hop a plane at eight or nine a.m. in the next few hours and end up in Chicago. I said, sure. So uh, I tell you, there's some real sleep deprivation, not just with me, but the producers at the time. They looked like red-eyed demons. Mm. I mean, these people were so, you have to understand, a show like Springer, they're worried about. Incidentally, I got a call from the executive producer at the time after our show aired that our show had tied, it was like the second most highest rated show of the season. They were actually going to bring us back on and actually have a marriage on Springer, but the entire staff was fired. The entire Springer staff was fired. Because realize there's a, a rapid turnover. You know, for whatever reason, there were giant changes. Now, uh, Jerry Springer was an extremely nice guy. Sitting in a green room for four or five hours from 5 a.m. until the shooting at 2 in the afternoon, drinking 30, 40 cups of coffee. You know, you wonder why people end up throwing things at each other by this time. Now, was that reality, though? What you did oh, on... Oh, I would have married her on TV, for sure. So when I asked her to marry me on the show, I actually, you know, would have gone through with it. But it wasn't for love. Oh, no, I did. It. Well, it was for love. I, you, when you have a relationship like I did with the person who I was with at the time and you are making television with that person, and you're living with that person. I was living with her. We were together every day. So I thought, if this isn't marriage, I don't know what it is. You know, we, we're doing everything together. So love is a very funny thing. It's a, it's a four-letter word, I believe. I believe it is. <laughs> well, you know what? I guess the people would say, has, had the relationship been consummated? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, it, it had been long consummated. Well, that's the difference between friends and marriage. Yeah, no, we were marriage. not friends. We were we in were, a okay, relationship, relationship that was a working relationship, a creative collaboration, and a you know, a, and a, a physical relationship. So we we touched on every ground. But it never, never did happen. You never did marry her. No, I've uh, amazingly never been married. But you would have for for television. <sighs> yeah, well, Tiny Tim did that too. <laughs> well, it, it, it's interesting. I, I would have, and she would have, certainly. We, we, I'm sure we would have. And it was just that, that moment where it almost could have happened, but it didn't happen. Somehow I was saved by the bell. <laughs> <laughs> but before, would you have regretted it? I, I don't think so. I okay. don't think so. I mean, at the time, honestly, at the time, I don't think so. I mean, when you, when I was living with her, and I'm not going to name her name because I don't know if she uh, would even want me to now, but, you know, but um, we'll say the Black Witch, who was a character of my show. I was living with the woman who played the Black Witch on my show, and we lived together. We traveled together. We did everything. I came up with shows at coffee shops. My shows, people were like, oh, my God, he's gone insane. We're actually invented on espressos <laughs> and high <laughs> amounts of coffee at, at different coffee shops with her. So uh, we did all these things in collaboration together. So at the time I said, wow, this is incredible. You know, for a very long time, you know, we were together 13 years, 12, 13 years. So it was not a minor relationship. It was as long as a lot of marriages are longer. Before I go on to take those glasses off, before, <laughs> before I go on to the next wow, thing. Wow, bright in here. Now you got to brighten it up in here. Let's talk, wow. about, let's talk about Sally Jesse. What happened there? She's a monster. She's a monster? A monster. Why? A monster. Why? First, uh, the reason I got on that show... That red woman with the red glasses is a monster. monster. I had no idea. Oh, you didn't know that? No, I didn't know that. For show. That had gotten oh, past me. I uh, first, I get a, 
uh, I the reason we go on the show is because uh, I send this copy of a show called Zex Rotica, which has the woman who plays the Black Witch and myself in it, and we, and I'm dripping candle wax on her, and there's a bit of light, and I say light S and M compared to the real stuff. It's very light, and I think I'm using Henry Mancini music or or something in the background, and so. The show was about people who put sex out in the public eye. Okay, that was the whole point of the show. I went on the show, and first, just getting there was a mess. I was sent to a hotel uh, in New Jersey. I said, I'm not staying here. You're putting, Senate, you're, you're putting me in Manhattan or I don't go on, period. I'm not going to sit in uh, Fort Lee, New Jersey. So they, the first they said, oh, they, they're trying to, they play you like you're a Columbus bumpkin, an idiot from the Midwest. They go, oh, all the hotels are booked through the whole city. Oh, really? Well, I'm booked. I can't do this show. Oh, just guess what? One just opened up a block away. So we, we ended. So I already knew. I said, this is, then they said, oh, we're going to need you to do a little scene on a park bench in the early morning. Can you do it? I said, sure. They said, show up at the studio. They don't bring a limo. They said, show up at the studio at 7 a.m. I show up. They said, oh, we're not ready. I go back home. Go back to the hotel. I come back. They said, come back in an hour. I come back. Come back. Go back. They said, oh, we're not going to use you. We want to show an interracial couple on, on the park bench. So we, we're not going to have the, the gothic -y look or whatever, whatever you want to call it. I've never viewed myself that way, but whatever. And so by the time I finally get on her show, which is in afternoon, I am already sweaty, hot, it's July in New York City, <laughs> dripping with sweat. Finally, they send a limo for us at Tuesday afternoon. We go on the air, uh, they, I, she, the show started to go, if you watch the thing carefully, towards the very end, one of the, someone said, oh, I really agree with him, I really like what he's about, someone in the front row said that, uh, she started to get angry. Um, a person, a producer on the side was like, cut, cut. Cut. She was losing control of the show. I was yanked back into the green room like a criminal, stuck in the green room and interrogated for an hour. Oh, what time did you say your show played on public access in Columbus? When did you say your show played on public access? Uh, how, what time? What day of the week? And they were interrogating me. I said, you can call the station and find out for yourself that this is because they were trying to act like I was uh, lying on the air. They were looking for something to get me with. So then she comes back on, she says, oh, we've checked out their story nine ways and back, and it, it's true that she was so angry somehow because I was talking about sex and violence. I was talking about that sex is not violence and that this, this phrase in our society is warping people's concept of sexuality, that putting something erotic or sexual on TV is not it is not bad. In Europe, it's done all the time. There's less violence. So I brought this point up. She couldn't handle the point. She started losing it, obviously. And then I was interrogated. I didn't think my scene would play. I was not brought back on at the end with the other guests. You know, we were shipped out of there. <laughs> I waited six hours at the airport, taken to Chicago, not New York, Columbus, New York, Chicago, Columbus, Spend a night in Chicago during a hailstorm or something, and <laughs> it took 24 hours to get back <laughs> from Manhattan. And by this time, I said, okay, we're not going to be on the air. I've been interrogated like a criminal on this show, and so I was really surprised when it played. And it played several times. They repeated it several times, and I had no idea it would play. I wasn't contacted by them. I wasn't told it was going to play. Nothing. So the whole experience. Every aspect of that experience was miserable. But that, well, now, was that necessarily Sally or just Sally's people? Well, she, uh, she, you could tell when we were on stage that she was somehow losing her temper. You know, someone, you could see that in her face, and probably the executive producer said, just let's cut the segment and let's just see if there's a way to get them out of this. So I was certain they were going to cut our part right off the show. Well, I tell you, it's interesting because we're going to segue into something now because a lot of the theme that does run through a lot of your work on YouTube and your public access show and uh, the movie uh, Checkmate is sex. What What is it about that that you push it so far all the time? I don't think I pushed it that far. 
you don't. I don't think I push it far, no. You don't. <laughs> no. You don't I think, think the really dripping do. of the hot wax or the... Oh, wax, uh, that's just a warm-up. Well, no, wait, I mean, I, 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 no, wait, no, wait a second. I wrote some, I wrote some of this. We, I mean, you, you've portrayed yourself as Hitler. In of so, course. Okay. Uh, now, uh, that's not... But let's, let's, let's not take this out of context. No, I said bongs, yeah. drugs, right. and sex. Well, it's not quite so simple. I mean, let's go back to the Hitler characters. People don't think that I have a Hitler fixation. The first time I played uh, Judge Dunkoff on my show, uh, Judge Dunkoff was I was making fun of the court system. So in that, at my first episode called Damon's Pig Roast, I play Officer P.P. Pigley, who, who arrests a woman for eating a Twinkie in a suggestive manner and takes her before an Adolf Hitler judge at the time. So because there were a lot of police brutality, uh, lots of corruption going on. That was 93, 94. I came up with that, the, those characters. And then I have a president. Then I create an anti-utopian future of a president, Dunkoff. Uh, he goes from being judge to a president and, uh, and where all rights are taken away from the citizens. So when I make characters like that, I'm making a social statement about liberties and things. So okay. that, that, that will shelve the Hitler thing. The erotic thing is an aesthetic thing, it's a stylistic thing, and I think that it is something you will see in many, many, many innumerable films and movies. I mean, think of, think of what is out there, and think of all of scenes you've ever seen that are extreme, and you will see that mine, the, the only difference is that, that people are paid in Hollywood to do that, or more extreme, I mean, again, You'll see shows where there's tons of gore, tons of, of sex, nudity, and tons of things that are way beyond anything I did. Yeah, don't you don't you ever get past it though? Because it can seems to be the continuing. I think, I think that I've always. All, I think that just naturally, sexuality is something that I'm interested in as a topic, and so. I don't know. I don't really want to get past it, frankly. You know, I mean, I mean in, cre in creative work. But I mean, I mean, not all of mine is. Well, I mean, let's let's be real here. I mean, there are those extreme things, but I have done many other skits. Damon's X versus the Arch Deluxe. My attack on McDonald's. <laughs> well, so here's the interesting thing. I thought your talk show was very interesting. I thought you did that very well, and that was one of the things that wasn't focused in on sex. Right. But ninety percent. Yes, I'd why? I'd say 70%. 70, more 70. than 50. Maybe, I, though I haven't actually counted the minutes, so I don't really know. I, I think it, 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 it was probably high. I think that, uh, who knows? I mean, you know, I, I was dealing, there are a lot of skits, like the, the Plan 9 from Outer Space skit. There, there was a use and display of passion on TV and promotion of the idea that there is nothing wrong with, erotica. I like personally erotica. So at the time in particular, I just like what I made. But that's where your mind goes. Not always. Not if always. I said to you, if I said to you, because you've done a lot of outrageous things, if I said, what would you do that would be outrageous now, later? Now, what would I do now? You would, I, would, I bet uh, you No, what I would do now, okay. I, a lot realize a lot of other things. The other big thing on my show were things involving hypnosis, hypnotic things. Do you believe in that? Strange. Well, yeah, it's possible. I, Are I you? Mean, it's Can you do it? it? It's possible to, I had a person who was a professional hypnotist look at one of the special effects I did, and he said uh, that, and he had been in a circus actually, and he said that what you're doing is very close to uh, some kind of real electronic hypnosis. I started, as I got into television, I, w I think I, w I loved uh, movies like Videodrome, and I got into television uh, wanting to create, all, and also I love comic book characters, I love exaggeration. So I got into television wanting to make something surreal. The key isn't so much sexuality as it is surrealism. What does it take? For example, also realize you have to put things in perspective. The I think that in the 21st century, like what I've done the last few years is I've been working on a book. A book which takes every possible permutation of idea and, and throws it together. So uh, the the erotic thing of that time period goes hand in hand probably with the shock jock thing of the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s. And then I really think, honestly, starting with this century and even 9-11, that you can't be shocked anymore. And I think we all had, 
if you put this in perspective, um, and, and that includes Springer, that includes Sally Jesse, that includes Howard Stern, and all these people, and myself included, were all on the same track at the time. And that track was to just push the envelope with that medium. And then once something real happened on TV, well, I was working on my book, then I was starting to work on a book. As public access went down, I returned to my writing. So I also spend much more time doing that than video, or have. Well, I want to talk about two things as we wrap up here, because I think it, you said it earlier on that a lot of people possibly uh, feel that you're gothic and that that's tied into satanic things, satanic. Uh, what is your feeling on that? Worship, satanic? Poppycock. Poppycock. So what is your what is your religious? I, I am a as I said I have a philosophy degree. When you have a philosophy degree, it, and you have studied every permutation of religion, every permutation of philosophical thought in existence, uh, I uh, would say I borderline. Uh, I, I'm not an atheist. You know I I'm not going. I don't think religion is part. I don't think it should be really part of. Uh, of what someone discusses, but let's just say I am very open to the possibilities of what is behind this universe. I realize I do not know personally what God is. I'm not claiming to be all-knowing about the creation of this universe, and so therefore I withhold what we cannot truly know. As the philosopher Wittgenstein or Bertrand Russell have said, I withhold from, I don't pretend to know. So I don't really exactly have beliefs because I think the notion of believing something you can't prove and you can't truly know is kind of erroneous. I think people would look at you if they tuned in now and they would say strange. What's the strangest thing you think about yourself? What is the strangest thing I think about myself? Yes. What, what do you think is your strangest characteristic? Are your strangest My love of stout thought? beer. <laughs> no, what, what is my strangest characteristic? Uh, I think if people knew me, they would be shocked at how ordered and regimented I am. They would think that the, the way you look and the way you are, they haven't seen me, for example, spend every single weekend typing for 20 hours straight or, or working diligently. I think they would be shocked at, at how I have an obsessive perfectionist side. With, with things, and I can't seem to control that. That's, there's an addiction to creation, and, and that's the only thing I've been addicted to in my life. I have complete control over everything else. Drugs, alcohol? Don't have any need, don't really care. Never had a problem? Never had a problem. Never had a problem. Sex? Can, uh, never had a problem. I can be celibate, I can be in a relationship, I can spend long time so When I got my master's degree, I was like a, a monk. <laughs> during the last year. I, things got carried away the previous year. I said, oh, you're about to lose your graduate committee. You better straighten up here. You know, uh, horrible procrastinator. If I could, I would sleep three, four days at a time, but I can't. Depressed? Never. Are you sure? Never. Never. Never depressed? Never. Okay. Work out too much. I don't believe in cognitive states. So if you're having those experiences in your head, I, you know, I do chores. So I, do, you, do, wait, do you believe in the clinical depression? I think that most modern psychiatry and psychology is just a load of rubbish. I think that people are wasting their time on psychotropic drugs. Why? I, because I. It think sounds a little Tom Cruise-ish. Well, no, no, it's not Tom Cruise-ish because I'm not a Scientologist because right. I don't believe in past life regression and all that other nonsense. But it's a little, you know, you don't need this. I don't think you need this. I think it's unhealthy. I think we're, we're breeding a society. Everyone's read, is, is analyzed with ADD now, you know, and it's because we live in a society where we now have more media than we've ever had. We now have the Internet. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of outlets that 20 years ago, 10 years ago, we didn't have. So we're, it's doing a different thing to the human psyche, and psychiatry is trying to analyze this and say, oh, your son's ADD, your daughter's ADD. I think, I think so that's different than, than clinical depression. I think ADD, ADHD. Well, either way, psychotropic drugs are probably more dangerous than most illegal drugs, you know, in my opinion, from what I've seen from people on them. 
just from my own personal experience. Really? Yeah. I I, I think when you I think when you over medicate that's a bad but thing. Most but most people I, do. Well, I don't know if most people do. I yeah. think I, think, I, I guess I I've just, known a lot of people on on depression medication, and I don't find them any different than when before. The, except they get out of bed now. Right. See, I just don't have that problem. I just don't have that issue because. I, like I said, I work out every day. I do yoga. I do uh, five Tibetan rites, which is a certain yogic ritual. I do. I, I go to the gym. I lift weights. I have a great. I could be a, if I wanted. I could be a fitness trainer. I don't really care about that. But I'm saying, I believe in the mind-body connection, and I believe when you strengthen the body, you strengthen the mind. I believe the breath and your ability. A lot of people don't know how to breathe in this life. They don't know how to just go. And calm themselves with their own breath. And I think that a lot of these notions like yoga and the, the true benefits of that could be taught in schools as opposed to just diagnosing people ADD. That's just one example. People could be trained and learn techniques, breath control, exercise techniques, etc., that would aid them in naturally overcoming things. Do you think you're far out? Do you think if somebody met you, they would say, weird, far out? No. <laughs> no. You don't? No, I don't really think so. I, I think that's a bunch of... Uh, you really don't? Not really. I mean, a little bit. A little a bit. Little. I'm, I'm not saying it's a bad I, thing. No, I'm not saying it's either, but I know people that are, are way far out, like, whoa, dude, you are out there, mm -hmm. you know, or you're believing in aliens, or you're, you're out there. I'm, I, I'm kind of a robust reality kind of guy. On some level, I believe in robust reality. See, I've heard, I hear all kinds of new age nonsense. I hear people talking about all kinds of things, about uh, energies from gems, about all kinds of stuff. And, and I'm really very empirical. And that's because I had a big science background. I grew up with a very strong, strong science math background. I was a math person. Who are you voting for in the next election? I don't know. Any idea? I'm not sure yet. Any po do you vote? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I just am not going to go there yet because I actually have to think about it very intelligently. And a lot of people before this election, you hear, I'm not playing this Punch and Judy show, okay? I'm not jumping on bandwagons, and I'm not claiming that, that the current presidency or what, I, I don't know what the contender could do. I don't know enough. I don't feel informed enough. And that's the truth. And, and, I, and I, when I vote in an election, I don't vote in, in elections where I do not really know the candidates. You know how people just hit buttons like monkeys for <laughs> judges, and they don't have any idea who these people are. I, I try to stick to the issues. In some elections, I don't even vote for the executive thing. I, I vote. And I think it, it's a right, and I think it's important for people to go out there. But you know, we're in a very weird time where you have, I'll tell you, I think in many cases, I, I, you have bank, banking concerns and insurance conglomerate concerns and many industries controlling government. And as long as you have corporations that can be treated as individuals and give politicians money as individuals, you're not going to have a fair society. So there's something intrinsically unfair about allowing corporations to dump money into the laps of politicians as individuals. What's your goal in life? To do the best I can do, whatever it is. Every day? Every day. Okay. Any goals left? Yeah. Well, What's the big one right now? To complete, to, to edit and finish my book. Edit, and you'll come back and talk about that? Yes. Has you, have you had fun? Oh, yeah. It's been fun. It's been it's fun. It's been fun. And you'll come back again? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Makeup and all. And unless you In the middle that. of July. It, you have to see what the barometric pressure is. We'll check it that morning. <laughs> Damon Zex, Don't Judge a Book by Its Cover. Very interesting conversation. See you next time.